Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing? I'm going to hand out the note card early today. And what I want you to do on the note card on one side, of course, put your name, as you always do, your ID number. And on the other side, I want you to write without looking on any device. The device is away, please. This is off the top of your head. I want you to list what you believe to be the steps in the scientific method. for looking anything up. and write down what you think the steps are to the scientific method. And while there are right answers and wrong answers, none of this will come against you. Write down what you think. This is your attendance grade for today. About one more minute. Okay, please pass them to your left. I'll collect them all over here. Make sure your name and ID are on one side. Thank you. Thank you all for that. So let's dive into today's stuff. Get on canvas here.
All right, one of the first things that we were assigned to read was about this individual, Virinia Bernal's, Bernalis? I don't know how to pronounce the name. I'm sorry about that. Don't wanna. So what was important about this? Why did I have you all read this particular piece? Computational chemistry, right? She got into involved in a variety of different fields and kind of felt out what she might like to do, right? Anybody remember what early on was interesting to her? We're getting down into some specifics, and so I, you may not remember all of them. Ionic something. Ionic liquids, yes. So she was interested in ionic liquids. What do you all know about ions? What do you all know? When I say the word ionic, what do y'all think? Pardon? Sodium ions. Okay, so it's like sodium and chlorine. Right? So you think of salts, right? Right? And what do you think of when you think of salts? Dissolves. Pardon? Dissolves in water. Dissolves in water. Okay. Typically, we think of salts dissolving in water. They're also solids. Right? But what was she dealing with? What's the term ionic? Liquid. So these are ionic substances that yet at room temperature are liquids. And it turns out that they're not very volatile. You know, you think of most solvents, right? You put out a, a cup of water and come back in a couple days and it's evaporated, right? It's dried. You put out a ionic liquid and you come back in three or four months, it's still there. It hasn't evaporated. And so these can have very important uses in industry. Right? They can have very important uses to have a cleaner environment because they're not volatile, so we can do chemistry in these things. We don't lose them to evaporation. Uh, so she got interested in that and has a lot of interest in things that kind of quote unquote save the world, right? Whatever that, that really means. And so I found her story to actually be quite inspirational from all of the things that you all talked about. The fact that she came from an area where her exposure to these types of things may have been challenging. She overcame that challenge. She got her undergraduate degree. She did a lot of research. She did a doctoral degree. She actually ended up coming to the United States to the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, doing some things. She found a way to make things happen for her. And so I found that to be a very uplifting story and something that I think you all should uh, pay attention to. So that's why I had you all read that particular uh, piece. Now, interestingly enough, although we're not going to show the video, the interview with former Golden Eagle Dr. Michael Sims has a connection to what I had you read. Does anybody remember what that connection is? He did his postdoctoral work. When I was interviewing him, he was in Minnesota at that college where she had gone to. Yeah. That's right, yeah. So there's, there's connections uh, in life, and so I found that kind of interesting. That was purely coincidental, by the way. I did not necessarily pick him up that way, but I thought it was an interesting coincidence. Um, Michael Sims, uh, can anybody tell me what he was when he was here? Was he just a chemistry major? 
He was not. He was a double major. What was his other major? You may remember. He was a polymer science major. So he did polymer science research. He was in the honors college. He uh, did research with me for his uh, for his uh, undergraduate research for chemistry. He was a double major. He took uh, at the time we used to teach honors organic chemistry. I used to teach that. Uh, we no longer offer that anymore, but. Uh, Michael took that with me, and uh, I think Michael's story is also a pretty uh, fantastic story as well. Michael was a local kid. He grew up in Hattiesburg, went to Hattiesburg High, came to Southern Miss, uh, started off in polymers, took organic chemistry, decided, hey, I want to add the second major, uh, and, and ended up going and getting his PhD. Anybody remember where he got his PhD? A place that gets hit by a lot of hurricanes. Florida, yeah, he went, to, he went to Florida. He was a Gator, did his PhD there and then went to Minnesota and did his postdoctoral work and now works in industry, I believe for Solvay. Uh, at the time that I interviewed him here, uh, he, was, he was still a, a postdoctoral uh, scientist. And so uh, it's quite common for chemists after they finish their doctorate degree to go and work uh, at a university for a, what we call a principal investigator for a year or two, maybe three, uh, to hone your skills in another area. It's quite common in our field uh, to do that kind of stuff. I did my postdoctoral work uh, not in Minnesota, but in Tennessee, and so it's, it's a common thing. So Michael's story, I think, is also a very good one, and I think he gave good advice to you all uh, being, being majors. And so do you all like seeing the interviews with the former Gold Eagles? Yeah, okay, I've got a bunch of them. They're starting to get kind of old, because I did this during COVID, so it's been a few years. But I'm hoping that by the time you all get ready to graduate, I'll be able to pick on a couple of you to come and be an interview for a formal Golden Eagle, okay? Uh, and so I'm trying to get a few people as they get ready to walk across the stage, so to speak, uh, to actually uh, do these interviews for, um, for the future. So I think it's very nice to have somebody that's been in your shoes, been sitting in your seat, so to speak, kind of speaking to you and giving you their, their insight from their experience. And I hope you all take it with the intent in which it is meant to be both inspiring and to give you some practical, uh, practical tips to being a successful uh, major, as I know you all will be. All right, so uh, there will be readings throughout the semester from this book called The Chemistry Book. It's a book about that thick. They are literally two-page entries, and there's tons of them. Chemistry has a very rich history. I am not a chemical historian by trade, but I uh, like to read about some of these things in The Chemistry Book. It's one thing I do in my spare time to learn about the history of where uh, our discipline came from. And so uh, today I really kind of picked on Robert Boyle, who is considered the father of modern chemistry. Can anybody tell me prior to chemistry as a science, what did we have? Alchemist. We had alchemy. And what did the alchemists believe? They could turn anything into gold. Turn anything into gold. We can take lead and we can turn it into gold, right? We can take that material and we can transmute it, right? Can we do that? Sure. We can do that, actually, right? Can't turn lead into gold, right? But have you all heard of synthetic elements, yeah. right? So there's the transuranium elements, and they're all synthetic. They don't exist in nature. Those were all man-made, okay, people-made elements. How do we make those? Anybody know? We take an element, and we bombard it with particles, to make a new element. We are transmuting an element. So the alchemists weren't necessarily wrong. We can do that. Right? Plutonium for plutonium bomb. Plutonium has better uses than being a bomb, but that's what you all know it for. Right? Is all people made. It does not exist in nature. For it, for all practical purposes. Can you find it somewhere in some probably a little bit? Right? But uh, we made it. For, uh, for atomic weapons, we make every bit of it. 
uh, that goes into those. And that is not the best use of chemistry, I will admit, but it is, it is an example of how what some of the old timers, I mean really old timers thought, has come to being with the modern technology that we have. And so, yes, we can actually transmute things. We can't do it the way that they thought, but we can do it. What was interesting about Robert Boyle? Yes. Yeah, he rejected the original four elements, right? People used to believe what? That we were made up of earth, earth water, water, fire, fire, fire yeah. wind. Or, yeah, yeah, right? Those were the four elements and everything was made up from that. Is that rational if you place yourself back in, say, the 1300s? Is that rational? That is a, we are making observations, right? And it looks like things either come from the earth, the water, the wind, and fire does things to things, right? It seems like those four things are essential for what we have. It was rational. But Robert Boyle rejected that notion, right? Now, what's interesting about Robert Boyle? Could just have anybody come up with that, you think? Was there anything special about Robert Boyle? There was one thing that was special back in that time. If you think back to the 1600s, 15, 1600s, what would you be doing as a human being most of your day? Trying not to die. Trying not to die. You would be trying not to die. You would be finding enough food. You would be trying not to get sick. You'd be trying to take care of your shelter. You would be having materials made that would blow your shelter down, and you would be rebuilding it. You would be dealing with that all the time. Most of your life was spent surviving. That's not Robert Boyle's case. He was privileged. And why was he privileged? Because his, dad his, his dad was an earl. His dad was an earl, and he left him more than enough land and riches to live out his life. So the only thing that really separated him from the other people, not necessarily was his brain power, but his, the fact that he had a lot of time on his hands that he could actually not have to worry about survival. So he could think about what most people thought of in the day as useless stuff. <laughs> the useless stuff that you find yourself thinking about today may one day be the thing that somebody's standing in front of a bunch of students talking about. That's possible. Right? What seems like useless stuff today may well be valuable in the future. Okay? That's the thing that I want you to take from this. We all live now, even the least fortunate among us, live in a time when we actually all have at least some leisure time that we can be thinking about big thoughts. We can be thinking about, I wonder why. That wasn't the case in his day. But there was enough people there at that time to actually start thinking about how he wrote this thing called the skeptical chemist. And what was he skeptical about? He was skeptical about the four elements. And what did he propose? He proposed atoms, right? Did he get it right? He didn't get it completely right, right? But he, he understood that there's got to be something more than these four elements. And that there was going to be something that was indivisible, we'll call it an atom, right? It's the smallest thing that we can have. And that you can take these atoms and you can start clicking them together somehow and making clusters and making things. And that these small things make big things, right? So it turns out a lot of the things that he did, that he thought about, he was right about in a time when he had zero technology to prove it. Right? Did he really use the scientific method? Not as we think of it today. Not in its refined form that we're going to talk about today. But he was using some elements of the scientific method, wasn't he? He made observations and he raised questions. And then he did the naughty thing. And what was the naughty thing here? He experimented. Right? And at that time, that was considered kind of a taboo thing to play with nature. 
right? But he experimented. And so he belonged to an organization that was called what? Anybody remember? The Invisible College. Doesn't that sound kind of dark and sinister? The Invisible College. Can you imagine us having the Invisible College of Arts and Sciences? Right? We wouldn't do that today. But they had the Invisible College. What did it later transform into? The Royal Society which is certainly older than the American Chemical Society and is certainly as prestigious as the American Chemical Society. Some would argue, my friends on the other side of the pond, as they say, would probably argue it's more prestigious. Yeah, we can leave that for, for debate. But it is certainly a very old scientific society that traces its roots, roots all the way back to Robert Boyle and even before. So these were a group of people that were privileged enough to be able to waste their time thinking about things that didn't really matter at the time to a lot of people. But it turns out our modern way of life would not exist without modern chemistry, modern physics. What else did you notice about Robert Boyle? Did he just do chemistry? No, he, he also dabbled in what today we would call physics, right? I mean, he played around with physics and light and strings and and weights and measures and all kinds of things, as well as physical substances like water and other things, and air and all this kind of stuff, right? So a lot of our founding individuals in these disciplines actually had a foot in multiple disciplines. You all will have a foot in multiple disciplines as a chemistry slash biochemistry, whichever one you're choosing major. What disciplines will you dabble in? Biology. biology. For those of you on the biochem track, right? Certainly. What else? Y'all got to take some physics, right? You got to know how things move. You got to know how things uh, interact. You got to know how light works. Absolutely. What else? Okay, let's just lump that all into chemistry. We'll just say chemistry is all together, including biochem. What? Computer science. Computer science, maybe. Well, let's maybe drop, uh, go back a little bit there and just say mathematics, okay? So you all are going to be dabbling in at least those four STEM disciplines, right? So you all are going to have feet in different areas. And so I hope that many of you will be able to draw inspiration from various disciplines of science and come up with your own interesting questions to answer in your research endeavors as an undergraduate student. And then as you go on and do whatever it is that you want to do, I hope you can take that with you, okay? Now, I just mentioned that there are multiple disciplines in science. We said there's biology, we said there's physics, we said there's chemistry, or biochemistry in there, and everything else. We said that there's mathematics, is that it? Are there others? Well, I'm just saying STEM. Just, let's just keep it to STEM disciplines. Engineering would be there. What else? Geology. Astronomy. Some people might say astronomy is encapsulated in physics, and I can understand why. Anything else that you all can think of? Botany. Huh? Botany. Okay. Botany. Oh, botany. Yes, botany. Computer science might be in that today, right? Yeah. Data science might be in that today. There's a lot of different disciplines. But all of these disciplines share one thing in common. Can anybody tell me what that one thing is? The scientific method. There is no biology scientific method. There is no chemistry scientific method. There is no physics scientific method. There is no math scientific method. There is the scientific method. Okay? And you all wrote down for me what you thought the steps were to the scientific method. But today we're going to cover that. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit more about the scientific method. And it all had to do with the fact that really as far as I'm concerned from a chemistry point of view, Boyle kind of got that started. Now I had you watching this PBS video about who invented the scientific method. Do we really know for sure that the invention of the scientific method really rests with one individual? It probably does not, right? But they give 
Elhitham had a credit for it, right? And what was interesting about his endeavors into the scientific method? We're not going to watch the video here. You all had to already do that. But what did you take from that video? How did he start off in the scientific method? Yeah. Um, like he was trapped in a like he faith and he was trapped in a room and he realized like from the little light that was coming in that he could see what was going on on the outside world. Like, yeah, that's right. So if you watch the video, you'll notice that they had this thing called a camera obscura that they built. Right? So what's a camera obscura? When I was younger, we used to build these things. I don't know if any of you have ever built one called a pinhole camera. Anybody ever build a pinhole camera? Probably not. You all don't know, even know what film is probably, right? So we used to make these little pinhole cameras. You take a shoebox. You all know what a shoebox is, right? We would take a shoebox, we'd put it into some dark, in a dark room, and we'd put a piece of photographic film on the back end of it, and we'd cut a hole in the front of the shoebox and we'd put a little piece of aluminum foil on it and then take a needle and just poke a pin. And then we'd put the shoebox top on and we'd tape it so it would no light. And we'd go out and we'd take a picture of something that was standing perfectly still for like a minute. Then we'd put our hand over the pinhole and we'd go back into the dark room. I actually used to have dark room equipment. And we'd pull the film out and we would develop it and you would see the image of whatever that you were shooting at. That was called a, a pinhole camera. It's really a camera obscura. It has no lens, it has no chips, it has no flash, it's the basic thing, but it would work and you would get a picture of whatever it is that you were, you were taking, taking a photograph of. And what you'll notice when you do that is that the image on the film is exactly upside down from the picture, the picture on the outside. And that's where Al Haitham started thinking. Unfortunately, he was jailed and he was placed in solitary and to keep himself from going a little crazy, he thought about things, right? And he noticed that there was a hole and that this light was coming through. You described it very nicely. And he could see things going on on this wall. It was dim, of course, but he could see it because of the light coming through the hole. But it looked up, it was upside down compared to that. And he started asking questions. What questions did he start asking? Yeah, does light go in a straight line? Is that intuitive? When you're just out walking in the, in, in the daytime, do you think, light's coming to me in a straight line? No, you probably don't think that way. But when you have a pinhole and you start to see things upside down and you try to reason why that is, you might say, maybe it's because light only travels in a perfectly straight line. And he did some experiments. Right? He set up some lanterns outside, and he would remove one, and he would notice that it impacts the other image. If it's this one, it's that image. Right? And so he was able to diagram this out and come up with that light must be moving in a straight line. Did he use the scientific method? Yeah, he was using a rudimentary form of the scientific method. What was the first step of the scientific method that he Gates. Pardon? We do ask a question, but first we have to have something to ask a question about, right? So we're going to make an observation. Observing your world is the most important thing that will lead to your success. Spending your time in front of your screen like this, you're observing a piece of the world that people want you to see. You need to get away from your screen and observe the world. At least a little bit every day. Okay? Because those who are observant are destined to have opportunities. What do I mean by that? It's a very broad statement, right? I mean scientific opportunities. You can you could go into the lab as an undergraduate and recognize something. And you could go to your research advisor and you could say, I just noticed something kind of strange. 
And then all of a sudden, you, the next thing you know, you're on a paper, and you're giving a talk, and you're being invited to come to graduate school to multiple places because of that observation. That really happens. But if you're not being observant, you're going to miss these opportunities, right? So being observant is very, very important. So we've got to be able to make an observation. What's the second step? Ask a question, right? We're going to ask a question. Something's curious. How many of you question everything? Most of us don't answer question everything, literally, right? But anytime you're told something, should you take it at face value? Sometimes not. Huh? Sometimes not. Sometimes not. Sometimes not, right? It is a fallacy to take everything at face value. You need to question it. The scientific method depends on your ability to ask questions. If you are a good question asker, you're a good questioner, uh, good question asker, you will be set up to some level for more success. And what I'm about to tell you, you might find absolutely appalling, but I do believe it's true. Questions are more important than answers. I hope you leave the university with an insatiable desire to question more so than having a bunch of knowledge in your head. Because today, you can go find a lot of knowledge using Google, Bing, whatever your favorite search engine is, ChatGPT. You have access to all kinds of information. But turn on Google and see when the next time it pops up with a question for you. The only time it's going to pop up with a question on you is which one of these ads have you seen lately? Which product would you buy? Right? It's not going to come up and say, I wonder how the cells in a tree talk to one another so that they know that water's got to get all the way to the top. Ain't going to do that, right? But you can do that, right? And so that's the, that's the important thing. So it's much more important that you have an understanding of how to question. What's another, um, another thing that we might assume a question is? Can we just ask any question as a scientist? Are all questions equally valid? What do I mean by that? I'm starting to tread on my humanities uh, colleagues' toes here a little bit. They would argue that all questions are valid. To a humanist, that's true. I don't, I don't, I don't disagree with that. But from a scientific perspective, that's not true. Why do I say that? Yes? Um, like there are things that we already know, and I, like sometimes like, some questions don't like, go deep enough for the things that we can answer. Like, you know. Okay. That's right. So some questions aren't deep enough. What else? Um, you kind of want to ask a question that can contribute to whatever else is out there. Okay. So you want to ask questions in areas that might have some value to society or to others. I don't disagree with that at all. But from a scientific perspective. Um, it needs to be valid. The question itself needs to be valid to your field of research. OK. So you need, so there's an ethical question. Am I asking a question for which I have some expertise yes. to know something, of, a little something about, right? To know whether or not it's a good question. That's certainly true. Are all questions? Uh, verifiable. I mean, can I answer all questions? No. no. And this is what's different between the humanities, in my opinion, and the sciences. The sciences ask questions for which we can falsify. So if you ask a question that I can't come up with some experiment that can prove that wrong, it's not a valid question. For example, from a scientific perspective, it is an invalid question to, to say, what is the meaning of life? That is not an invalid thing for you all to think about. We all think about that. There's a human side 
to that. But I cannot scientifically do anything about that. There's nothing that I can do that you come up with an answer and I go, I can prove that wrong. I can't because it's based on your feelings, your emotions, your culture, your religion, whatever the case may be, right? Many, many things go into that kind of answer. So we have to have a question that becomes a hypothesis, right? So we have to form a hypothesis. What's the definition of a hypothesis? What do you think will happen in the experiment? Okay, it is a question that we can actually test and verify and, and falsify. That's the important thing. Falsify. If I was to ask each of you to develop an experiment to, to prove something, right? What is the fallacy in that? Proof. Pardon? Proof. Proof. Can we proof anything? No. Very few things. I would say there's some things we have proven, but it's hard to prove something. It's hard to know something, believe it or not, right? But it's easy to disprove things, right? If I set up an experiment, then if this fails, then this can't be true, right? And so therefore the hypothesis is false. You have to set up your experiments in a way that they are falsifiable, not provable. And people get that mixed up all the time. My daughter's at Princeton studying chemistry PhD. And when she and I talk, she'll say, I need to prove. I'm like, no, you don't. You have to set up an experiment that can disprove what you, what you think it is. Because you can only provide evidence to support a hypothesis. It's hard to prove a hypothesis, right? But at some point, we get so much proof that we say, we believe it's true. I have seen no evidence to suggest that this statement, this hypothesis is not true, right? So a hypothesis, it's very important. It must be falsifiable. How do you spell false? Ah, we'll just say false, OK? <laughs> falsifiable. I'm not the best spell. All right. How do we go about <clears throat> testing a hypothesis? What's the next step in the scientific method? We have to experiment. What do we mean by experiment? Test the hypothesis. <clears throat> it's a test. It's a test of the hypothesis, right? What do chemists think of as an experiment? When you all hear the word experiment, what do you think? Describe it for me. Pardon? Lab? Yeah. You think about going to a laboratory? Do I need a laboratory to do experiments? No. 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 Why in chemistry do we think we need to go to a laboratory? All right, we're typically working potentially with hazardous materials, things that you don't want to spill everywhere, right? But do chemists also work in the field? Of course we do, right? I mean, there's environmental chemists that go out and sample you know, river water, ocean water, whatever the case may be, you know, and they collect samples and they actually analyze them. That's their laboratory, right? What is a laboratory? It is nothing more than a physical place to do work. You all have heard of computer laboratories. You, you know, artists call them studios, but they're really laboratories, right? They wouldn't say they're laboratories, but I mean, it's a place of doing work. They just do creative work there, right? So a laboratory is not necessarily something that is purely scientific. My garage is my laboratory at home. I'm out there piddling around doing all kinds of stuff all the time, right? But I also have a laboratory in Bobby Chain Technology Building where I do things with chemicals. Okay, so, multiple types of laboratories. What else do you all think of when you hear the word experiment? Pardon? Chemicals. Chemicals. Okay, so some type of supply. We need, we need things to actually do our experiments, right? So there's chemicals. You all probably think of balances. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Multiple experiments. Yeah, we might have to actually do multiple experiments, right, to, to uh, 
disprove our, our hypothesis, right? Right now, from your high school experience or from your gen chem, what's an experiment like for you? Titrations. Okay. What else? Observations. You're making observations. Discussions. Discussions. Getting into kind of a lab report, which we're going to talk about here in just a second. You said something? Analysis. Practicing techniques. What else? Procedures. Procedures. Yep. What else? If any. Mistakes. Mistakes. A laboratory, that's another good point. A laboratory should be a safe space to make mistakes. I want you to make your mistakes in a controlled environment before you go out and build a big chemical plant and then it goes boom. I want it to go boom on a small scale in a controlled environment that nobody gets hurt in, right? So yes, very good. There are mistakes. Mistakes are how we learn. But we scientists have to be careful with our mistakes because our mistakes can sometimes be energetic. <laughs> and it's hard to put a digit back on, right? Or an eye. Right. So laboratory safety is really not part of the scientific method, but it is part of the practice so that we can go home with all 10 fingers and 10 toes and two eyes, right? We do that. Everything that you are describing to me so far is an academic learning laboratory where we give you the procedure, where we give you the equipment, where we give you the materials. And we do you all a very big disservice in that because we are missing one part of the scientific method. Which part is it? You made no observation that caused you to be curious to do that experiment. You may make observations during your experiment that you're doing, but you did not walk in and say, hey, gee, I wonder what happens if you take a gas and you push on it. I saw somebody push on a balloon and I saw it kind of go pop. I wonder why that is. We told you to go into the lab and to take a flask and to measure a gas and to pour out a liquid and to make observations about it. What you are learning in the academic laboratory right now is not the scientific method. That's why I'm here talking to you about the scientific method. When you get into your research lab, you will be given a problem to work on but you will be expected, at least a rudimentary level, to come in with some of your own ideas from your own observations. That's where you will start to experience the real scientific method. That's why I'm encouraging all of you to get involved in research as early as possible. Okay? That's where science happens, is in the laboratory, not in the classroom. You're not learning any science right now, really. Right? You're just not. You're not learning any real science in your chemistry 106 or 107 class. You're learning facts, figures, problem solving skills, important things, but you're not necessarily doing the scientific method. All right, we finished up our experiments. We've got our data. We've got our observations. Now what do we do? Yeah, we're going to collect data. So I'm, I put that with the experiment. We've collected our data. We've done our experiment. Now what do we do? Pardon? Discuss and analyze. Yeah, you gotta analyze it, right? You gotta what does it mean? What does all this data mean? Right? And what's that gonna do? Do you think in a real research lab it's one experiment, one paper? Sometimes that happens, but it's pretty rare. Usually it's an experiment that leads to another experiment, that leads to another experiment because we got more questions. Well, yeah, I answered that question. I kind of have an understanding why that happens now. Wait a second, I thought it was going to happen this way, but it didn't happen that way. I just falsified my hypothesis. Do you just stop? No, you ask a new question, right? You ask a new, I wonder why, I wonder how. Now, you will hear me use the word why 
But this is very important for you all to understand. Science can never answer why. Science can only answer how. I don't know why the world exists. I know how bits and pieces of it work. Okay? Again, that's the difference between the humanities kinds of questions and the science kinds of questions. Okay? So it's very important to understand that science can really only answer how. Right? And how requires at least more than one variable. Just about everything that we think about is something in relation to another. Think about all your mole calculations. Right? It's how many sodium atoms do I have? Well, what are we talking about? We're talking about sodium chloride, so it's relative to that, right? And I've got so much mass, and you do all the calculations. You can figure it out. Science is a very relative field, right? It, it just is. So, yes, we do our experiments. We do then some type of analysis. And I think I heard somebody say discussion. That would be fine. Now, they all use different terms for all of these steps in the scientific method, right? But uh, we're getting at it here. And then one of the most important pieces of the scientific method is what? Repeat. We might repeat, okay? That's, that's a very true thing. We never do an experiment once. We always do it at least three or four times, right, to make sure that our observation isn't a fluke. But that's technically not part of the scientific method. That's good practice. Right? It's good practice. Reproducibility is definitely important. But the last step is to communicate that. Communicate the results. Why is that important? right. What is so powerful about the scientific method? Okay. It is, it is a process of all the sciences. What else? It's foolproof. It's foolproof? I'd say so. You'd say so? Why would you say so? Well, looking at all these, uh, all these steps here, it looks like there's no room for error as long as you do all these perfectly, which of course we never really are. Yeah. Probably not. Well, that's the human side of it, though. It's the human side of it. That's true. The scientific method is self correcting because of that last step. We communicate our results. You do an experiment, you have your own biases, you have your own opinions, you've invested everything into this, and you've analyzed the results from within that frame of reference. Right? And you think that this is the right answer, and you publish it. And Audrey comes along and looks at it and goes, I think it's baloney. And she said, you didn't do the right experiment. You did an experiment that, of course, proves what you want to see. But this experiment will definitely tell us the right answer. And she will conduct her experiments, and then she'll come back and say, oh, by the way, I think you're right. Or, aha, you're wrong. And she'll publish her results. And then you can look at that, and you can say the same thing. I remember uh, one of my teachers when I was in graduate school, she did <clears throat> her postdoc with a very famous chemist named Herbert Brown. He's long since deceased. Uh, but he and George Ola, two Nobel Prize winners, she told of the stories when they would go to the American Chemical Society meetings every fall. These are the big national meetings. They would be in a room and they would be having debates about who was right. They would be having these open debates because they both had different uh, theories on carbocations at the time. And George Ola would basically call Herb Brown an idiot. Herb Brown would call George Ola an idiot. And then they'd go have a beer together. They didn't hate each other. They just had different points of view. And it turns out both of them ended up winning the Nobel Prize. But it's because they were communicating the results and they were going back and forth that led to better and better theories. Right? So science is the ultimate, or it's the longest standing open source. You all hear about open source software and things should be open and available. Science started that hundreds of years ago. Right? Put it out there, we're, we're trying to find the truth. Okay? So very, very important that we communicate results. Right? And so these are the six steps 
that I say are in the scientific method that I think more or less, if you look it up, you will find those kind of same six steps. You've got to first make some type of observation about the world that causes you to ask a question and form a hypothesis. You have to sit down and think about what that hypothesis should be. Can I test it? Do I have the tools to test it? What do I need to test it? What experiment can I do that can actually show this to be false if it's not true? That's the important piece. It's easy to come up with an experiment that supports your idea. You can always skew, skew the experiment, right? So you've got to be careful about that. So we develop a good hypothesis that can be falsifiable. We run an experiment or experiments. We analyze that. We think about it. How much time do you think scientists actually spend at the bench in the laboratory as a percentage of a week? Let's say I'm a full-time employed chemist at a company. How much time do you think I'm going to spend at the bench mixing things and stirring things and doing stuff? If you're spending 40% of your time at the bench, you'd be spending a lot of time. When I was a postdoc, it was probably my most productive research period of my life, because I didn't have to teach. I didn't have to worry about feeding myself. I didn't have to worry about taking classes. I would just, so maybe I spent 30%, 25, 30% of my time actually at the bench mixing stuff. Most of my time was reading developing experiments, or analyzing data, or writing papers. But most of the time, I was not sitting there mixing chemicals together. That was the minority of my time, in all honesty. Uh, so all of these things come into play uh, in the scientific method. All right. So, I want you to leave with your degree from the University of Southern Mississippi, understanding the scientific method and the fact that it applies to more than just chemistry. It applies to a lot of parts in your life. So anytime you find yourself questioning something, think about it from a scientific point of view. Okay? Very, very important that you do that. All right. So I've got everybody's attendance for today. For those of you who wanted to redo your uh, semester by semester guide, I need you to give me your original form and the redo, uh, the, the redo. Just set it up here, and I will give you your 60% credit for those that you got fixed. And I will see you all next week. Oh, don't forget, uh, tomorrow there is uranium in you. If you need an activity to do, you can do that activity. Uh, it's in the miscellaneous folder. Thank you. Mm -hmm.